now in its ninth year, this is GabNet, the great American broadcast network. Talk like you've never heard it before. Hey everybody, I'm Alex and this is the Ramble. And yeah, we go until midnight tonight in New York City. Ladies and gentlemen, there he is. Oh, that's Steve Kravitz. We love him. We uh, watch him talk to us and we talk every couple of weeks. How you right. doing? How you doing? I'm doing all right. Yeah? yeah? Lowe's is treating you well? I can't complain about it. It's a job. Do they give you more and more stuff to do? Or are you working more? Yeah, I am. Yeah. That's cool. And I got, a, I got a raise. I got a little raise. Oh, oh wait a minute. Hold on a second. I'm, let me guess how much. All right? It's per hour, right, is the raise. Right. 25 cents. 38. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. We're in the money. Oh, oh yeah. Bye, bye, bye. Well, how many hours a week do you work? Well, around 14. 14 hours a week at 38 cents. Makes them around $5 more a week. That's right. Yeah. I'm rolling in the money, Alex. Hey, listen, why don't you send some my way? I could use it. Why don't you send some my way? I could use it. Well, uh, I do. I do have some. I, right, I have none. I have enough to. I have enough money to live on, if I live to be a hundred. Is that right? And I don't eat. That is. <laughs> don't you get food stamps? No, I. What? No. Although I wonder if we can get food stamps once. Marjorie's still making a slight uh, stipend from her former company, which, oh, is that right? which uh, goes away in a year, exactly a year from now. Uh, but once that's gone, I wonder if we are eligible for food stamps. I mean, we should take advantage of all that crap. Why not? Right, why not? Were you doing food stamps for a while? Yes. Now? Yes? And and do they work well? Yes. Really? How, how does it work? How do, I, I have no idea how food stamps work. You get, you get like a, a debit card, and you just swipe it at the grocery store. And And they take off certain items that are covered under... The food stamps, right? Right. Certain items are covered. Certain items aren't. In other words, you can't buy chewing gum, okay? No. Right. But you, you can't, can't buy. You can't buy ready. You can't buy prepared uh, meals. Prepared meals, like what? What do you describe as prepared meals? You mean? Well, like a sandwich. Oh, okay. In other words, stuff or, that's stuff that's ready to go and ready to eat, right? Right. But if it's in a package at the store and it's frozen or whatever, you can buy right. that, right? And you can buy sushi. Sushi is covered. Yes. Well, wow, see, that's so civilized. Because we buy all we buy a lot of our foods from Stu Leonard's uh, by Instacart because they're all the way up in Connecticut, and they have the best sushi. If you is that eat, right? if you eat it that day, right? It's delicious. And then they have lobster rolls. Oh, really? Yes. And they're really good lobster rolls. I mean, there's good meaty lobster in the lobster rolls. That's expensive, though. It's about $30 for three of them. Is that right? Yeah. But the sushi's up to $10 a piece. So, you know, it's... Yeah, where I am, it's between 7 and $10, yeah. depending on what you get. Well, I imagine sushi would be covered under food stamps because it is, it is food. It is nourishing food. Right, fish is quite nourishing too. You got, you got the little avocado in there, and the little tuna, right. and the rice. You know, it's it's it, it probably it probably matters what the food is and what it's right. comprised of. Right. All right. So last time we were talking, we were talking about the clubs in San Francisco. You said you never worked the other cafe. Right. Why didn't you ever work work the other cafe? I didn't get along with. Uh what was it, Bob Ayers and Chip Romer? Mm-hmm. Is that who that was? Yeah, yeah. I never got I, I never got along with them either. I just didn't get along with them. 
Yeah, but because I had that damn radio show, they kept trying to kiss my ass, so, you know. Right. Uh, but I didn't like them. I, no. I, I didn't like that. That was that was not the club I hung out at. No, me neither. I hung out at the Holy City Zoo. Holy Now, the Holy City Zoo, let's explain the Holy City Zoo. Um, if it's you, had 74 if, people. If you went into the Holy City Zoo and wanted to change your mind, you had to go outdoors. Good night. We'll be here all week. Yeah. Uh, it was 74 people? Right. I worked on that stage once, okay, because I worked a lot of the stages in that town, you know. Right. Hosting shows and so on. And I went on to that stage, and there were like five people in the front row. And I panicked. Oh, really? Well, here's the thing. People said, how can you panic when there are five people in the front row? And I said, and they said, but you, then you go down to, uh, oh, I don't know, Stanford, uh, the Stanford Theater down there, the amphitheater, Frost Amphitheater. And you can, you're in front of 9,000 people and you don't panic? Right. And they said, no. And they said, why? And I said, a big difference between a small number of people in a room right. and 9,000 people, which is just like this sea of people. You know, it's just a, it's like a painting out there. Right, right, and, right, right. And at, at the Holy City Zoo, you always felt that somebody from the front row could jump at you on stage. I mean, if you weren't being funny enough. I saw a preacher jump on an audience member. Really? Yeah. Really? He must have really been, was, been drunk. It was too funny. That it was, was too funny. That was when he was drinking, I suppose. Yes. <laughs> yes. But uh, it, it was amazing to me um, the size of that place, but it created more comedy talent than anything. You started at the Holy City Zoo and you worked your way up. The ultimate. Yeah, the punchline. The, the punchline was the ultimate to play. Right, at that point. And, but you had to have a place to start because they weren't going to put you up at the punchline. Maybe they, they had an open mic night on Mondays, but it was always structured. Hey, what else have you done? Okay, right, now you can right, do right. open night mic here. So, but there, it was like open mic for everybody. And you, right, you just had to sign up. And, uh, yeah, and stay awake long enough. Right. You know, like what was the latest you ever went on at the Holy City Zoo? Well, probably closing time, probably around two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if you got better and better and better, they put you on earlier, right? Right, yeah. right. But uh, it was the club. It was the club where people learned how to be comics. Right. And how to develop material. And uh, It was magical. It, uh, describe why it was magical. Because, you see, I never, was, this, I, I never this... worked that club as a comedian. I've been there. I worked that stage, but I never worked it as a comedian. Right. Yeah. So I don't know. There was something living in the walls. There was something mag just magical about it. I can't explain it. It was just magic. Yeah. I mean, there was a little Robin Williams there, and there was a little bit of Dana Carvey there, all these various right. people who had ever worked there. Right. And, and what did you get paid at the Holy City Zoo? I don't know if he got paid. I don't think he did. Not for the open mic nights. So if you got the weekend, you got paid a little bit of stipends. Uh, yeah, weekend, stipend. weekends they would have a a a lineup, right? Of people that people wanted to go see, right? And usually it was like you know uh, Steve Kravitz probably made that right where you worked right. a weekend. Oh sure, I had lines at the zoo. Yeah, wait a minute, gotta stop my watch from ringing. Uh, yeah. Uh, Eventually, I headlined the punchline. Did you headline the punchline? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. That must have been a thrill for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, because I, I, I never remembered you as, a, as particularly as a headliner. Right. You know, I remember you as a middle act. Right. Would you say I'm, I'm right in thinking that? No, I got to be a headliner. Really? I, I, eventually, I got to be a headliner. Yeah. Did I help? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Good. Absolutely. Because I could do your show, and your show, I would pack the place if I did your show. 
So what, if I plugged the gigs on your show, it would pack the place. Do you think these clubs hired you or anybody because uh, you'd come on my show and plug it? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. They'd ask you to do that. Well, I know. I can remember playing, playing foo bars and being driven in to do the show. <laughs> foo bars was where? Oh, where was Foo Bars? It moved. It moved? I, I, can't, I can't remember where it was. I don't remember where Foo Bars was either. It was in South Bay, maybe? No, East Bay. East Bay. Like Walnut Creek area. Hmm. Hmm. Somewhere around there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but anyway, uh, and also you had these clubs surrounding San Francisco. You had Rooster Tea Feathers in the South Bay. You had Tommy T's in San Leandro, and then later right. on it was in Walnut Creek. Um, yeah, yeah. The punchline was in Walnut Creek. The punchline was, yeah, the punchline was definitely in Walnut Creek. And they were in Sacramento. And then there was uh, Laughs Unlimited in Sacramento. That was my first road gig. Oh, okay. I never heard of Laughs Unlimited. Did it? Was it around a long time? or? Oh, yeah, I think it's still around. Oh, really? I think so. God, I never heard anybody come on my show and say, and I'm going to be at Laughs Unlimited. Well, that's because they were probably out in Sacramento. It was like a road gig. You'd go out there and stay for the week. Oh, okay. You know, it wasn't like Walnut Creek where you commuted from your home in San Francisco. Yeah, well, what, where was it again? What's that? Uh, Laughs Unlimited. It was in Old Sacramento. Old Sacramento. Okay, that was far enough that they'd have to, like, you know, Put you up. Put you up, yeah. Right. Or drive you in to do my show. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. Which full bars did. Yeah. But the Holy City Zoo was just a very important club. When it closed down, I, I mourned it, and I never played there. Right. You know, but I knew that all the comics that I had on the show at one time or another had started at the Holy City Zoo. Right, right. And you were allowed to be... Not bad. Good. You were allowed to. You know, yes. You were allowed to be bad. Exactly. And you could still get on the next night. You could bomb on Monday and still get on on Tuesday. Yeah. 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 You know, as you were learning the craft. Mm hmm. I mean, I had no material when I first started. Yeah. Yeah. I just did all audience work. Here's the other side. Uh, what happened? I, all of a sudden, Echo decides to say something to me. What did it say? I don't know. It, no, I don't want anything. Hold on a second. Let me just turn this thing off. Come on. Stop it. Stop it. It can't stop it. It won't stop. Huh. Where? Where's the on-off switch? I can't even find the on-off switch here. Okay, so I press this. And it's, oh well. I don't want that. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. I don't want it. Okay. Power off. Uh, okay. Yeah. Power off. Okay. You figured it out? Yeah. I hate it when it does it when I'm trying to do something here. Right. And then all of a sudden, also my screen is flashing at me. What's all? Yeah. It's one thing or another. I'm tired of all this technology, Stephen. You well, know. I don't have to deal with it. I just have to click on the link, and here I am. Well, here's what happens. You know, in my line of work, not your line of work, you get up on a stage, if the mic's working, you're ready right. to go. Okay? You just That's stand right. there, you do your act, you leave. Even if the mic's not working, you can still do your act. Exactly. In my business, there's a whole bunch of technology between you and the final product. That's right. Okay, so all this stuff has to work. Right, and it has to work correctly. It has to work correctly, exactly. If any part in that link goes out, you're screwed. So the, 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 you being able to do your craft is dependent upon all these technological things working. Right. So I am at the mercy of the technology in order to do my craft. That's right. Um, you know, I, I imagine 
you know, you do television, it's really got to be terrible. I mean, I have enough problems here with just video going out on, on in a very small ba- on a very small basis. Right. Okay. Uh, oh, wow. when you do films. Hmm. When you do films. When you do film. Always. Oh, oh, there. Oh, what happened? All of a sudden, my. Oh, all of a sudden, my screen went blank. What is going on here today? Anyway. Are we recording? <laughs> huh? Are we recording? Yeah, we're recording. Okay, don't worry about that. So anyway, so what I'm saying is the technology is a, is a real problem for me because everything I do is dependent on that technology working. Right. And working perfectly. Right. Yeah. You know. No glitches. Huh? No glitches. Right. So, Didn't we have a glitch at one point? Wasn't there a couple of months back there was a glitch? A glitch? Of what sort? Like you, you would flicker. I don't remember. I don't remember. But you I know. think so. I think that, that happened maybe last year. Maybe that was last year. There's nothing wrong here except that the picture, the screen is flashing every now and then. I don't know why. Probably I'll reboot the machine and everything will be fine. Right. You know, that, but it, but all I'm saying is there's too much technology between me and doing my 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 ta- my thing. And plus, I'm doing it all so that when right. something You're goes, the engineer. When something goes wrong, I'm I have to take care of it and we're talking and I have to take care of it. Right. You're the engineer as well as the personality. Yeah. I'm everything. I'm, right. You know, you're so, the producer, you're yeah. the director, you're the engineer. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, uh, I will agree with anybody who wants to say, well, you have less problems with what you're doing because there's, you're handling all the stuff and you can take care of it, but it also means that my brain has to be going two ways. I have to be thinking about the technological end, and I have to right. think about you and I talking to each other. Right, you have to multitask. Yeah, and that's why when I was in this business, uh, I when I would work a, a studio, a station, a place like Sirius XM, I would walk into the studio and I would look at everything, the control board, how the control board worked, what things you had to flip to make this work and that work, in spite of the fact that I never needed to do it because I had a guy running the control board right, and I had somebody answering the phones for me. So all right. I had to do, all I could be, had to be concerned with was doing a show. Right, well, was talking. But I felt I needed to know how that process was being done by everybody else. So if something went wrong, I could say, hey, is this working or is that working? Right. You know. Well, in the early days of radio, when, when, I, when I was a disc jockey, you had, I had to have somebody who was a licensed engineer. Well, that was that was a, an interesting thing. When I first started in this business, uh, I could only work radio stations that were called third-class radio stations. In other words, they didn't have transmitters over about five thousand watts, you know, and they couldn't be directional. And then I could work on what they called a third-class uh, restricted license. Okay. Okay. And how you got those is you went down to the FCC. All of a sudden, my thing went blank again. Boy, this is strange today. Anyway, it's not affecting the program at all. Um, uh, I went um, down to, where was it? Uh, You go down to the FCC. They say, I want a third class restricted license. And they say, okay, here it is. And you you had to write in your name and sign it. Right. You know, and cut it out on a, a piece of cardboard and put it in your in your pocket. And that you that was your license. Right. But I couldn't operate any anything over a certain amount of power. So if I wanted to go to work for another station that had a higher power and I didn't have that license, I might not get the job. Right. So I decided I didn't want to get the license. You could go and cram for these licenses, okay? They had these cram tests that you could, $300, they'll send you all the books and stuff and you read them and they test you and they th- and then they send you down there and you get it, but you don't know a goddamn thing. You just had wrote answers. Right. Right? 
So uh, <laughs> I, uh, I decided I'm not going to get one. And I, if somebody said, why? I said, if I go to a radio station, they really want me. And I don't have a license. Uh, they, they're going to have somebody on staff who's got a license. Right. If they, right. If they truly want me. If right. they don't want me, if it's just like, I don't know, let's see if he's okay, then screw that. So I went through my career without having anything else but a third class restricted license. And um, I got the jobs. They made sure there was somebody there to read the meters and to run the transmitter and everything right. like that, right? And usually I worked days. I didn't work late nights or whatever. And there was always a reason why somebody had, had to be there. So. I uh, I never I never had a problem getting a job because I didn't have a, a first class license for example as an example. And they, with a guy who worked overnight, they wanted him to have a first class license because they didn't want to have anybody there to run the transmitter. Right. And this was right. all about running the transmitter, folks. It had nothing to do with your talent. It had nothing to do with you know anything else but running that transmitter and taking. Right. They weren't they weren't on air. They weren't on air personalities. They were in the in the in the work on the technology side. And you had to take a reading every half hour. Oh, to, I didn't know that. You had to go up to the uh, up to the thing with all the dials and all of that and all the meters and stuff, and then write down what the stuff was. Now I didn't know what I was writing down. I just knew it was a process, and I I did that. And you did it every half hour. And sometimes you'd forget, and you wouldn't do it for about three hours, and then you'd sit there making them up. Right. You know. But if the FCC walked in and saw that you hadn't filled it out during the last half hour, you were in a lot of trouble. So. Right. But the FCC never walked in. I can't remember. They always said, you know, if you don't do this and you don't do that right, the FCC will be here. Uh, they may drop by and then a spot inspection, and then you will, you'll be all screwed. I never in my entire life saw a member of the FCC or a staff member of the FCC come into my stations. Right. Never. Never. And then they always said, you know, if that swear word got over the air, we're going to lose our license. That was a lie, too. Up to that point, nobody had lost their license that way in the history of broadcasting. Is that right? Yes. You know, I mean, they, you know, they, they might write you a letter and say, we heard the word fuck went over the air. What do you have to say about that? And then the guy says, well, we were Let's running, we, we, we were running a 30, a 57 second delay, but somebody forgot to push the button. Okay, fine. Hey. Thank you. That's your, your excuse. Uh, but then we found out something else is that it, you didn't have to have a seven second delay. I thought it was a five-second delay. Well, seven so it, it, the reason they called it a seven-second delay was, here, here's a little history, folks, you never knew about the radio business. They would do, How they would do a seven-second delay is they would have two Ampex tape recorders next to each other. And then they would simply run a tape through one of them, but then they would run the tape from this machine onto the reel of the other machine. So it had to go through both machines. And by the time the tape got from machine one to machine two was seven seconds. Okay. Okay. Are you getting me on this one? Yeah, so far. Yeah. And so that one was the one that went out over the air. So they, okay. would, they would hear you going out over the air. Uh, it went down to five seconds because they found a way to do it on one machine by reversing the recording in playheads. You know, it is. Could it just but, be a, it, a, a dead spot it, in the in the in the broadcast. Uh, you would uh, you you would just uh, either blank it out, or we had a little thing you could push, and it would it would go and play a, a, a what do you call it a uh, uh, it a would, beep yeah yeah a beep or it would blank it out or whatever you know right uh, that's you know but anyway so that was that was that was the history of the seven second delay. And then they went to digital delay. With a digital delay, you just hit it, and the digital delay would go to real time. And then over seven seconds, every time it, you paused or whatever, it would catch up until it did seven seconds. Oh, really? Yeah. So, uh, uh, 
the wonderful history of censorship, folks. It was how you know how many millions of dollars the broadcast industry spend in order not to let the word fuck go out over the air. Right. Right. Silly, huh? I mean, really silly. But uh, well, I still don't swear on your show. You don't swear here, no. No, and, very rarely, very and, rarely. And you can. I just did. Right. You know. Um, but now they have they have machines listening to me to see if we say it. Hey, listen, I just saw we've run out of time. Are you Is ready that right? That? That's it for us, folks. Thank you, Steve. Good, Thank you, Alex. Good seeing you again. Now in its ninth year, this is GabNet, the great American broadcast network. Talk like you've never heard it before. Yes, talk like you never heard it before. Yeah, okay, all right, okay, yeah, yeah. Let me see here. I should get myself centered here. I have a little, little problem here of being centered, of not being centered, of something. Hold on. There we go. Ah, ah, there we are. Hmm. Hmm. Is that it? Okay. All right. Let me see here. That's good. All right. Uh, wait a minute. I got to do something. Hmm. Because you can see the edge of my thing there. Okay. Now we're okay. Anyway. Hey, how are you? Hey, nobody's calling tonight. You know something? I could just I could just close this thing down now. I don't have to do anything. You know, uh, nobody's calling me. So I'll give it a couple of minutes, and if uh, nobody calls, we'll just uh, call it uh, a day or night or something here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anyway, um, I'm trying to think. Do I have anything I want to talk about? And I don't have anything to talk about. So uh, I am I guess I won't talk about anything. Is there a reason why nobody's calling tonight? Did I do something horrible all of a sudden? I don't know. Anyway, so uh, let me see here. Uh, I really don't have anything. I, you know, I was, I was, well, I was paying attention, trying to pay attention to the news, and I just can't pay attention to the news anymore. I just, it just so bores me. Um, the amount of uh, time that is spent on these various networks, especially MSNBC, really just belaboring subjects over and over and over and over and over and over again. So, anyway. Well, doesn't look like anybody's going to call tonight. Uh, so, uh, and this is going out, is it not? Yes, it absolutely is going out. Let me just make sure that the video is going out. Uh, here, wait a minute. Let me see. Uh, let me just do that. Yeah, the, the video's going out. The audio's going out. Everything's going out, and nobody's calling. Well, that's it for me tonight, folks. I have. Uh, I could sit here and I could just talk, and then uh, maybe one or two people would call. But I'm just saying the hell with it. You know. Is there a problem at all? Let me just see here. Let me see. Well, no, there's nothing on the chat. Nobody's doing anything on the chat. That's amazing. And I do know, I see the picture. It's going out. So, I don't know. I don't know what the problem is, but uh, uh, we, uh, we're we not getting any calls from anybody. Hmm. Could somebody try calling? Just so I could see if there's if there's if there's nothing wrong here. I don't know. Anybody out there? I'll just type in here. Anybody out there? Uh, let me see here. Oops. There. There we go. Anybody out there? And, I, and nobody seems to be replying. Hmm. Well, uh, I, I'm amazed. I do know that it's all going out. There have been some drop frames tonight. What is that, the reason for that? Is there some problem out there? No, I don't see anything that, uh, that looks like it. Well, uh, I just, uh, that's it. 
you know, I, I have no reason to keep going on with this thing unless I get some people calling. Um, but, uh, it, it, you know, if there's a problem, oh, there we go. Anybody out there? Hey, from Corn Patch, Rod, uh, I just got, okay, Scott, uh, okay, yeah, all right. Oh, there are some people out there uh, on the uh, chat, so I don't know. I don't know what's happening here. This, uh, this, may, this could be it, folks. This could be the night in which I say, hey, what am I doing this for? Uh, let's see. Yo, yeah. It says some people are out there. And are you getting, by the way, are the people in the chat, are you seeing a video and hearing a video? Okay, is, is that okay? I just want to make sure that it's, uh, that it's all right. Uh, Logging on now, says Brian Bravo. What? Yeah, hold on, Brian Bravo. Let me see here. Well, nobody's nobody's calling. That's really something. That's really something. Well, maybe two, maybe Thursday nights is just not a good night. Is there is there something happening out there that I don't know about? No, I don't think so. Well, here comes Brian Neary. Hello. Okay. All right. It's uh, it's just uh, you and me, Brian. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. He's got to come in here. Brian? Brian, there we go. There's Brian. Okay. All right. Uh, and uh, he should be uh, with us any second now. All right. Hey, Bri it, hey uh, Brian. Hey, uh, wait a minute. Okay, Brian. Hello, Brian. We'll torture everybody with just you and I on the show. Just you and I. Hell with anybody else. From here on, if they couldn't call after 7 after the hour, they don't get to get on. <laughs> um, Mike Chisholm wrote me and said, uh, Jay sent me, the, oh, I see. Okay, all right, all right. That's something else. It has nothing to do with uh, with this. So how are you doing tonight? Uh, I'm doing okay. Now that seemed to have a little hesitation. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, I've been working in Lodi for oh, we we built that we built that factory a year ago. Mm -hmm. I think last April we actually opened it up, and uh, we made an announcement that we're going to be closing the Sunnyvale headquarters. So that's where I started, like uh, almost 19 years ago. So, but, but you kind of outgrown that, right? Yeah, yeah, and you know, it's like it's in the middle of Silicon Valley, and Google bought the land, and so we have a lease. But um, we're we're moving. You know, we built that big building in Lodi, and now uh, we got some new machines up there. We custom make all our own machines, so we we've had those machines, and now we have. We just finally, and I've you know I I'm, I've known for probably, a while. But. Probably you should tell our audience to a certain extent what it is exactly you do. I mean, you're, what your company does. They yeah, make, make, so we yeah. we make <clears throat> PCR tests for infectious no, disease. They, they so make that. Those, with... no, those are, those are actually containers for Tic Tacs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Almost. Oh yeah, we put the sample in here yeah. and put it in the instrument, and it does all the mixing and the PCR and and uh, so, yeah. So um, yeah. So now we're you know we're coming out of the COVID stuff, and uh, we have a window of opportunity to move a lot of the stuff up to Lodi now up to the new, you know, it's the gem of our company now. So I was employed like seventy five, and now we're. Yeah, we're global, so it's pretty crazy. So but... is the company doing well? Yes. Even coming out of COVID, you know, coming out of COVID doing well is just surviving. We're now we're getting back to all the stuff that we used to build before COVID. So flu is always our biggest season. Mm -hmm. So we see that coming up again in, you know, about three well, or four months. Well, but... well, every time I catch the flu, just know I'm thinking of you and trying to give you business. Good. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff that we test for, even HIV, HPV, and stuff like that. And then uh, we started actually with anthrax with uh, after 9/11. So we were before I started with the company, they were doing bio threat mm -hmm. um, out of other containers. And then 
Um, 9-11 happened. The three congressmen got the anthrax letters in the mail. Mm -hmm. And we partnered up with Northrop Grumman. So we test, we still do, we test uh, air samples of the post office every half hour for uh, uh, for anthrax. For how, how, do, how do we know that you aren't sending out those anthrax letters? <laughs> no, because that's not <laughs> worth it for us. <laughs> but yeah, so then uh, we had a new CEO group came on uh, right when I started, and they started saying, you know, they said, it, infectious disease, where are we going to make the money? And they started doing that, and then, yeah, we've been pretty successful. Hey, let me ask you a question about that, you know, the anthrax letters, because mm -hmm. most times it's talcum powder, right? Yeah, it's going through our stuff, so it's bogus stuff, like the stuff that just got sent, like, last couple months ago, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Our, this guy Bragg here in New York, the uh, DA. He's getting a lot of those letters, you know. Yeah, if it's, if it's going through the U.S. mail, it'll get caught by our stuff. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I mean, but I mean, does it say? Uh, does it notice talcum powder? No, 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 no. Oh, okay, no. but a lot of times we, this isn't. They say it's a powder, but it turned out not to be anthrax. Yeah. you know. Yeah, and then our stuff, we, we were allowed so many false positives when we signed a contract with them, and uh, we have never had a false positive, and we've done. Jeez, maybe fifteen wow, million amazing. cartridges, I think. So you you should yeah. have some false positives, right? No, not in the field, not not in not in the post office field for sure. Oh, okay, all right. Yes, Jeff. Do you still have a facility on the East Coast? No, no, we only have the. We only have manufacturing in the West Coast. We have Chicago. They have some some departments over there, but no manufacturing. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, since now, I was does in charge your company of do the testing or just make the testing materials? Nope. Yeah, we make everything. So we make the disposable cartridge, we make the instrument that it goes in, and we make all the chemicals that go inside. So we purchase a couple companies and the plastics, all the plastics we make too. So we, over the, I've been there 19 years, over the last you know, 10, 12 years, we've purchased a couple of big companies to help us out with uh, any sourcing. So your company's been in business for quite a while now. Yeah, like 25 years. Yeah. Wow. Wow, do you ever? Yeah, and the, the guys were really smart how how they made these because inside inside there are all these chambers and each chamber does something unique and it, it instead of the doctors uh, mixing all their stuff doing sample prep outside mm -hmm. and then pouring all that stuff into something to detect it our stuff you just put the sample in you break it off and it does everything there's a little container there's a little syringe in there that that takes all the fluid brings it to another chamber, goes back and forth, brings it to another chamber, takes your sample, and then it goes through this you little said, diamond you here. Me, you sent me one of those, and I've never opened it up to see what was inside. Yeah, don't don't drink it. <laughs> oh, uh, is, there, is, there, is there stuff already in there? Uh, they, yeah, the, they're dried chemicals. They're just buffers and probes, and then um, the liquid is uh, just a buffer. It's harmless. But So what we do, I mean, it's like magic. But what we do is we take the DNA. So if we take a sample when it goes in there, yeah. all the mixing takes your DNA and splits your DNA, and we try to glue it back about three million, four million times, and then we detect it in that little window. And if we see it, then we know you have whatever we're checking. Wow. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Pretty crazy. It's like yeah. electricity. Oh, Just well, turn look it on. Who's and... here? Look who's here. Look who's here. Oh, secret message. Yes. What's the secret? <laughs> Ask Alex if you can. No! <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Go, go. What was she whispering? She wants a candy and a yogurt drink. So I know she just had a sandwich, so. She can See now. what responsibilities you were left out of, Alex, all the time to make sure that they have food? Well, you know, <laughs> sometimes I miss not having had children, you know? Yeah, but, you know, I was 48 when I had uh, Adrian, and I, I was, like, back and forth, but I... I was having too much fun, and I know I didn't want to be with somebody, and so. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I but I could see doing it. I mean, after all, the woman gives birth to the baby, and then she nurses the baby, and I'll just, you know, I just tell her I'll come back in five years, and uh, I'll then then play with the kid, you know. Yeah, but like like you said, you couldn't have had a career like you had if you would have had children. But you, you know what's what's what, what I've heard, and and tell me this isn't true that the wonderful thing is now that she's the age she is mm -hmm. you can be have more of a friendship relationship with her you can have a more of an ongoing relationship with her yeah I mean, actually she, i'm getting to the point where 
the stories i'm starting to tell a lot of stories about me growing up and stuff like that because you know you you think you tell them and they don't remember i don't like I, you've asked me a couple of times i don't remember how far back i don't remember how young i was till i started remembering but with her now i can tell she's starting to remember you know i mean she's seven but you know like the stories to to tell her these stories to pass on some of the stories about my life because uh, and like her, you know, she's named after my mom who passed away when I was 13. So, yeah. so we've gone to the funeral site, you know, where she's a mausoleum. So she's seen her name up there, which is pretty weird, you know, but, yeah. um, so she's understanding a lot of that stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it, it's just that there's more, you can have more of a, of a relationship with the kid on kind of an, not an adult basis, but kind of like an adult basis. You can have conversations yeah. with them. So. Yes. And I mean, Jeff will know too. Like, then they start talking words and stuff like that. And you're like, well, how, where did you learn all this stuff? They absorb so much at that young age. Yeah. And they learn too many words. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jeff. I, I think a lot of girls like to have the real tight relationship with their dads. Yeah. 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 Do, you, do you think, do you think the girls who are born into a family, bond better with the dad than the mother why is that yeah you would think it would be the other way around exactly and, and when when we found out that it was going to be a girl you sort of oh man i you know i want to i thought i wanted a boy to go to the car stuff and all that stuff and then everybody told me like jeff said that if you're if you're a man and you have a want have a girl it's a tighter bond than you would with a boy. And you I, don't I, think I, that I, until I, you've had kids. Yeah, but I just figured it out. The reason they enjoy dealing with their fathers as opposed to their mothers is they're practicing wrapping guys around their fingers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, getting everything from them. Yeah. Sucking them dry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it takes until they're third year old. Then then they can do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hello, Tony. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. I'm enjoying the conversation. Yeah, yeah. that is true. Because I was closer to my mother than my father. My father, if I complained to him, he used to say, go ask your mother. <laughs> I was actually closer to my father than my mother. Really? Yeah. yeah. You said that, yeah. Well, I, well, I was close to both of them, but I was around my, my mom more. My father was very smart, oh. and he was, uh, he was very funny. You know, he had all the things that I really needed as a kid, you know. Oh. Uh, and my mother, yeah, kind of a dope, you know, not too bad. Did, did your mom work, Alex? Yeah, my mom worked. Yeah, uh -huh. she uh, she worked. Uh, well, I mean, for a while there, she just raised me. You know, mm -hmm. that was what mothers did in those days. And then right. when I was going to school and everything, and she felt she could go out and have a job, she uh, went and got a job with the uh, Variety Artist Union. That's the. Uh, uh, what, how can I describe it? The, uh, uh, AGVA, which was the American Guild of Variety Artists. And these are uh, people who tap dance, you know, and juggle. Oh. And uh, uh, as, as her boss used to like to say, he said to me once, he said, how would you like to belong to a union where your president is a ventriloquist? <laughs> you know. But that's what they did. They, they was American Guild of Variety Artists, and she uh, she was in, ran that office for quite a few years. And my father but, went into real estate because music wasn't a business anymore for a violinist. You know. Oh really? How well, what, how old was that? Uh, what happened was when the fifties hit. Okay, oh. combos came in. In other words, if you had a nightclub, you didn't hire an orchestra. You hired a, a combo. Uh, and or for, or first you'd hire a band. Well, the different you know the difference between a band and an orchestra. Yeah. Orchestras have strings. Bands uh, don't. Uh, okay, they have horns, they have drums, they have all of that, but they don't have strings. So really, when music kind of cheapened a bit, you know, in the fifties, um, uh, my father found it hard to find work. I mean, there just weren't a lot of jobs for musicians, mm -hmm. you know, so for violinists. Mm -hmm. So consequently, he he uh, he then found a, another career selling real estate. And mm -hmm. he, I don't know if he was a good real estate salesman or not. I think he was kind of just so-so. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it was enough to put food on the table. Mm -hmm. But Did you ever think about 
taking that different instrument? Huh? Try a different instrument. He, uh, 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 that's not really here for you. You're a violinist. It's not like you can suddenly turn around and learn how to play a trumpet. Yeah. I you, understand that. You, <laughs> yeah. Guitars yeah. were very popular. Yeah, but, but that wasn't, that isn't a, a, you can't learn that. You know, if you play a violin, you're playing a pretty one dimensional instrument. I mean, it doesn't. If you if you play uh, a trumpet, maybe you could play a uh, tuba, or you could play some other brass instrument. Yeah. But stringed instruments, you know, guitar is a whole different thing yeah. than a violin, you know. And um, it was just it was very difficult for him at that point, you know. But yeah. it it's kind of the first time I saw in my life that one business replaced another. You know, and and just like I'm seeing with radio now, there's no radio left. Come on, it's just these fucking podcast. Uh -huh. You know, any weasel can do a podcast. I. Uh, <laughs> that's why I hesitate to call this a podcast because I don't. I don't. Podcasts are cheap. They really are. Uh -huh. They're bad radio. And, and I don't care if maybe, oh, I have a podcast I love listening to. It's about this person who murdered somebody else in the Midwest and the whole story. Oh, no, she's still watch this. You know, that watch kind of crap. Murders. You know. Hey, I could tell you some, 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 some stories that would curl your hair, but I'm not about ready to. What do you mean? Like, what kind of stories? Huh? What kind of stories? Like on the podcast? Oh, because I, I know a lot more than has ever been reported about the Manson killings with Sharon you Tate. Did. Oh, yeah. I'm fascinated. I read a book on that by Tom O'Neill. And I, and, I, and I knew, I've known that. I've held on to that story. Really? I've oh, held, I held on to that story. I mean, yeah. I've held on to that story for the last, what, 40 years, something like that? Can you write it down in an envelope and say to Brian I'm here? Nobody will believe it. At least we'll know it. Well, I could privately tell you, but I would okay. not do it publicly because my. No, I wouldn't even call you crazy. Because my I'm, I'm going to write that down so when I'm in New York, I want that story. Because it, it, <laughs> yeah. it, 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 there was. You know a, what I was reading, Alex? I, I read I'm trying, the, I'm trying to say something. I was going to tell you about that since you mentioned Manson. I read the book, Alex, by, I think it's Tom O'Neill called. It was chaos. And you know what he alluded to in the book? You don't have to answer it. That they, who was the one, the uh, coffee heiress? Was that Abigail Folger? They were saying that the guy she was dating was a drug dealer, he was saying, pretty much. That's what he was saying. I don't know the whole thing. Mm -hmm. That's the coffee I got. I got it for $9. I didn't know that she was the <laughs> coffee heiress. I actually did. I, got, I was like, oh, shit, now that you said that. I wonder if the family still owns that company. Oh, just. Oh, your, your volume's really loud. Oh, it is? I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. yeah so are we. Uh, <laughs> God, I can just, I can, saying, Alex? What I love is I, I can beat up on him like crazy, and he can take a punch. Who's that? that? You. That, <laughs> I I got, you got me thinking now on that thing now. Oh, boy. Ooh. <laughs> Fascinating. Yeah. So anyway, uh, no, but I, but I'm, I won't even allude to what the no. story is about. But you, is that is that is that because you knew people like just from yeah, I knew radio people. stuff, I knew, sort of, or I, I knew people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, actually, I, what I heard, I got through a guy by the name of Michael O'Donoghue, who's been dead for years now. Used to write for the National Lampoon and was one of oh, the really? original cast members of Saturday Night Live. Uh, and he had a girlfriend who was somehow involved in the news. Uh, and he told me some stories that, uh, oh, wow. you know, and said, but, and then I mm. knew this particular story. And there was a guy by the name of Ed Sanders. Ed Sanders, oh, I mean, yeah. one of the members of the, the Fugs, of the Fugs. Yeah, yeah, the Fugs, yeah. And Ed Sanders wrote a book called The Family about Manson and about the Manson family and the whole thing, right? And I had him on one night, and I, during a break, I, I just wanted to find out if I had heard anything that was close to the truth. Oh, wow. And I mentioned it to him. This is off the air. And he said, how did you know that? 
Mm. Oh, shit, you know, then you are. And I said, I got it from somebody who was was involved in reporting the story. And he said, yes, everything you heard was absolutely true. Wow. He said, but I didn't. I said, why didn't you put it in the book? He said, anybody who releases that information will get themselves killed. Uh, Holy moly. So I have kept it a secret. And the only time I may reveal it is when I know I'm dying. Yeah. You know, when I'm, oh, I'm, God, I'm, I'm don't, don't, don't do not do it. He covered the case, I think, at the at the courthouse, I think, Ed. Ed. I was reading on it. He was know. at the courthouse. I, I, I don't think Ed was. I don't think so, no. I remember him in an interview saying he, and I watched an old interview, I think it might have been Dick Cavett, and he said he was at the, I think he said he was at the courthouse. I don't know who he was writing for at the time. He was covering that case. Well, he wasn't really a journalist. He just was. Well, he, I was going to ask you, was he a newspaper man? No. I wasn't sure what he was. He was one of the fugs. He was a poet. Yeah, he was a poet, but then he went into writing, though. Like, was he like a reporter then? Or? He went into writing a book called The Family, which oh. is, I think, maybe one of the best books about the Manson family. Yeah, that's supposed to be good. I didn't read it yet, but yeah. I went a little bit. But there's more to that story than has ever Yeah, been you got my book. curiosity now because I read the other stuff on it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't say, yeah, I'm scared. I got goosebumps. Yeah. Really. So, you know, but, um, you know, the funny part is if I decided I'd do that as a podcast. Oh, that'd be, that'd be gold, Alex. Oh, that'd be gold? It'd be an hour long. Oh, my God. Okay. I would just love to know the story. It'd be an hour long, and then, then I'd, I'd wind up uh, with my brains blown out. Oh, so. yeah. No, you can't let <laughs> you that. Know, I mean, I'm kind of curiosity, you know? Yeah. I'm thinking of what it could be. He probably knows a lot, yeah. Something doesn't add up there, that whole story. It doesn't make any sense. Well, I mean, it's, a, it, it, you know, well, I won't go any further. Yeah, don't no. go. No, it's interesting, though, yeah. Yeah. But, but, you know, it's funny what you said, though, Alex. I don't want to bring it. He never was even at the house, Manson. And he got, no. and he got. I mean, we know he was crazy, yeah. But he was never even there, like, doing it. And well, they put him away. Well, I mean, he sent the people there. Yeah, yeah. You know. It had to be fabricated, yeah. Huh? Well, you were right too. Bubulosi was sketchy too. It looked like he was selling some almost. Well, Bubulosi may have known something he didn't want. To yeah, I, I didn't trust that guy for some reason. Yeah, I, I mean, it's know. you know, it's so long ago now. I mean, yeah, it's just a fascinating it. story. There's a lot of things yeah, to it. It was so long ago that uh, to suddenly say, "Okay, uh, it's now time for us to tell the story." It's probably the time to tell the story, but it's still a problem. Mm -hmm. there's any... be still people alive right huh? yeah Polanski's still alive well Polanski's there... still alive yeah but he him, wasn't yeah. even there when it happened he wasn't even there he was shooting that movie overseas yeah 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 he's oh. a great director even though he's all crazy I always but... hated what they did to Polanski <laughs> you know I mean yeah whatever he did wasn't right but on mm -hmm. the other hand Jesus what he went through emotionally i mean he 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 and sharon tate really loved each other they had a very close wonderful relationship and there was a baby coming oh. and then his wife gets murdered the baby gets ripped out of her belly oh. you know i mean imagine just going through something like that that's got to make you a little little wacky you know i mean he had a lose i mean how can you just to cover that i'm just to be a cop on that and you scene, know the, you... the girl who he had sex with i'm trying yeah. to remember her name now uh, 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 she, she um uh she even said hey you know uh, it, it wasn't it didn't scar me for life and i if i forgive him you know so you should forgive him and she said that to a judge when he was trying to get back in this country and the only way they'll let him back in the country if he admits he did something wrong, and then mm. they'll 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 let him off the hook. But the last time they said that, he was told that uh, if you say you did it, we'll just let you get off with a slap on the wrist. Okay, so he admitted to it, and they threw him in jail. <laughs> they okay. lied to him, uh, so okay. he went to Europe. And he won't come back if somebody says to him, "Well, if you just admit you did it, we'll we'll uh, forgive it, but we won't we won't forgive the sentence until you admit it." And how old is he now? 
Oh, gee. I just look, he's 89. Hold on a second. He's 89? 89? And Alex, what a great movie. Rosemary's Baby and Chinatown is a classic. Remember Chinatown is... A, just, oh, that's such a great movie. I didn't remember it. But... He cut his nose, remember? Yeah, yeah. It was a but, great movie. I yeah. mean, he was... Uh, he was he he's great and I think it's a shame he's never been able to come back here. But he did win an Academy Award for Best Director while in Europe. Uh, yeah, the pianist, I think, right? The pianist, yeah. 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 That was a good movie too, Adrian yeah. Brody, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, a great a great director. One of yeah, he really directors. is phenomenal. That Rosemary's baby, every time I watch that stuff, I'm like I'm still scared of that movie. It's so good. Did you ever see the fearless vampire killers? I didn't see it. I'm looking at it. 1967. Any good? I, I it, it's weird. I'm gonna have to. Watch. I just see it. 1960s. I've never heard. I've never seen it. I'm gonna have to check this yeah, out. Yeah, no, it's it, it's weird. This oh, it's Tom. What are you saying, Alex? Huh? I'm gonna have to. Uh, Sh Sharon, Let me Sharon Tate was in it. And... Yeah, Sharon Tate was in it. Yeah. Who's this other guy? Jack and, and McGowan. McGowan. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 uh, and uh, Polanski was in it. Oh yeah, you're right. I thought he was just a director. Oh, yeah, Alfred he plays. Of course, oh wow. I'm gonna have to He's hear. also in Chinatown too. What was he the guy by the like the the, the policeman Alex or no? Who did he no. play again? He's the guy that cuts off the cuts off. Oh, uh, he was the guy who could the most? Yeah. Even... Hey kitty cat. Hey kitty cat. That's a great that is a great movie. Yeah. You like sticking your nose in other people's business, kitty cat? Yeah. I gotta watch that again. That's a great Thank movie. You. I love it. That's the more we talk about picture. it, the more I love that movie. Yeah, it's so Phil Morris. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, you know. So, um, let me see here. What else? What else has happened? What's happening in the news? Anything? Trump came to New York. Oh, Trump came. Oh, to New York. Uh, yeah, oh did you have to remind us? Do you know why he was here? Yeah, he was here because he had to testify. That's what he was telling me. I was listening to my brother. He's testifying. He was, it's all oh, okay. He was getting deposed. Oh, okay. He wasn't listening to him. Yeah. And this, this other case may even be more trouble for him. Uh, he may, if, if the, if the uh, state attorney general, Letitia James is her name, if she uh, manages to get the goods on him, he'll never yeah. be able to do business in the state of New York again. Well, that wouldn't be no loss. No, he'll you. have to do it in Florida, How and then they can go bankrupt. Pay? What? How many people did he not pay? Me and my brother were talking. All he does is litigate people. What? What? Wait, 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 the, like Trump, he never like he's always in court suing somebody. He's always reneging on paying people with business. Yeah. It just seems like he leaves everybody with a bad taste. Like you're, you're always holding the bill with this guy. It looks like. Well, I would never want to. If I were a lawyer, I would never want to do business with him because he never. You, you know, never, never going to get anything. You with never him. get paid, and uh -huh. then on top of that, you stand a good chance of going to jail. Like what's his name? Like uh, Cohen. Cohen. I like that they call him the fixer. <laughs> well, I mean, what, like what I think is so terrible about it is the horrible things that. Um, uh, that he has to say, Trump has to say about Cohen, when uh -huh. Cohen went to jail for stuff he did for him. Yeah, he was only doing what he was told, really. Huh? He was only doing what he was like a loyal soldier. I did what you told me to do. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there was no more loyal soldier <laughs> than yeah, Cohen. Yeah, he went the time for him. In fact, I don't know that in spite of the fact that he's turning tail on, on Trump, if I like Cohen any more than I would have before, because the guy was pretty well, you know. He, yeah. he was Trump's fixer. It's almost like I compared it. I was telling this to Phil. It's almost like when they got Gotti, they got Gotti because of Sammy the Bull flipped him. So Cohen is his Sammy the Bull. Well. Indirectly, like. I'm making it like a movie, like, you know. Uh, what do I, you think? I, okay. I think, if, if, you know, Trump. And I'm, again, folks, I know I don't like Trump. Okay. So the hell with you. Uh, I don't like Trump. All right. So we leave it at that. But let's take it just a little step further here. I don't like him. But he is the closest thing to a mobster we have oh, these yeah. days. Yeah. You know, I mean, he he, he acts like a mobster. He acted and, like a mobster as president. Yeah. You, you had to kiss his ring for everything. Like, I'll send those boats, but you 
you gotta you gotta kiss the ring here a few times. And he wants everybody to be loyal to him, but he has no loyalty towards anybody else. That's what the amazing part is. Yeah, I that's mean, a gang. You're okay. right, Alex. That's the epitome of a gangster. Hey, listen, I expect loyalty among people that I know, you know, but I give them loyalty back. All right, yeah. and it, it that's why you're loyal to people because they're loyal to you. But he's not loyal to anybody. He'll turn on you in a split second. This guy went to jail for Trump. Yep. Okay. And he can't even practice anymore, I don't think. You know he can't practice anymore. No. He lost everything. Well, and he sued him for three hundred million dollars. I mean, come on. Yeah, five hundred million dollars. Where where <laughs> you know, is yeah, left, gonna, like where's <laughs> Cone gonna get five hundred million dollars? Yeah, hold on, let me pull out of my ass. I mean, really, where's it coming? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe he'll get 35 cents for expenses, <laughs> yeah. you know? I mean, come on. It's so, just the whole audacity of him. Like, yeah. all this of course, maybe he wants 500,000 because he needs that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Hello, Charlie. Hi. Hi. How's our favorite uh, um, astrophysicist? Well, I'm doing pretty good. I got done early umpiring, so... It's amazing astrophysics, and and now you spend your whole time umpiring. Yeah. Which did you enjoy more, astrophysics or coaching baseball, softball? I love studying astrophysics. I love teaching astrophysics. I didn't like my professors. <laughs> oh, okay. But when you were teaching, did you try to be better than those professors? I always, I was better. <laughs> wow wow what did you think about Verna von Braun oh that's uh, it turns out you talk about the space program he yeah. built the space program so yeah. hey, but he was a Nazi though yeah well, yeah he was a Nazi and he worked for Hitler during the war yeah yeah, yeah. but you know what it is and correct me if I'm wrong on this, uh, uh, Ch uh, Charlie, because I'm going to be talking about perhaps some people you like. Mm -hmm. And that is, scientists have no morals. They just care about getting the thing done. You know, and, um, I, and, and that's why I think von Braun was so close to, you know, was so kissing ass with Hitler. He just wanted to get those rockets built. He wanted to get them exactly, to go up. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And there was, and as a scientist, he had no morality. Does that make sense? Well, he in, in started the sense doing that, that when he was three years yeah. old. Huh? He started learning physics and, and other things and when he was three years old. Yeah, yeah. But, I, but, but what I'm saying yeah. is, what I'm talking about is that <clears throat> it seems as though sometimes people like that have no morality. Because all they care about is, I want to build that rocket. I got to get that rocket up in the air. I got to, yeah. you know. I think in general, scientists have morality. It's just they don't care about the morality of the person that they're working for. I think there was a joke, uh, a song by Tom Lehrer called Verna von Braun. Yeah. Because uh, they go up, they go down. But I don't care where they come down, says <laughs> Werner von Braun. You know yeah. I mean? And that's really what it was, what I think it was a, essentially a good way of looking at uh, at him. That he uh, just, yeah, there's truth in a lot of humor, and there was definitely truth in that song. Yeah, but then he came to the United States, and he he got our space program going, and okay, he did something good for us too. Yeah, you know, uh, the problem was that we had for a while there was who got the best scientists after the war. They were all racing to Pinamunde which was where the yeah. rockets were built, to grab yep. the, sci the best scientists they could. And it was between us and the Soviet Union. Yep. And they got the best scientists. That's why they had the best rockets going up early enough. That's why they got the space first. Yeah. But Von Braun did a really good job for us. I mean, he, mm -hmm. you know, he, got, he got it going okay. So, anyway. But uh, you see, this guy is, I often say, I would love to just sit here and talk with Charlie one night, do a whole two hours with Charlie. <laughs> because hey, he, Don't tempt me with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, because, I mean, the stuff you, you, you know, you're amazing. You're just amazing. 
and you know the, you you wrote, they tried that CIA tried to hire you. you know? Yeah. But uh, I, you know, I just stumbled through life. <laughs> you, you stumbled. <laughs> well, that's not what I call stumbling. Oh, we don't buy that. We don't buy that. Yeah. Uh, Char what? Charlie, do, do do you feel do you feel like jealous of all the stuff going on now in that field? Um, in a sense, I, like I still have friends in astronomy. Yeah. Uh huh. And then. Yeah, and then but... Like the stuff we're like talking about the other day, you know, with the with the web, you know, yeah. and, and all that stuff from sixty minutes is pretty crazy. Yeah, I think what would have driven Charlie crazy is the same thing that's driven me crazy over the years, and that is that we went to the moon. We went there about five times, I think it was. Yeah. Now we didn't go back. What was I that all never about? Never understood why we dropped that. And we dropped it. And the fact of the matter was that uh, I resented the United States for doing that. I mean, how dare you put all that work into it and all you turn into is NASA hauling and, and you know, uh, NASA hauling and shipping up uh, using the rockets to go up to the uh, space station, you know? I mean, it's just nothing. Just terrible. I mean, and how many years did we waste? I figured once we got to the moon, oh, the future is endless, and we're going to be up there, and we're going to have a place on the moon. We're going to learn how to live there, and then from there, we're going to learn how to go to Mars. And, yeah, and I, it just I stopped. Swear, I thought we would be in Mars in the 80s. Oh, I, I thought we would be there. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, I mean, now we can do it, and it's much easier for us to do it. We have the science to do it. Yeah. that we we had to how can I put it we had to hobble the whole thing together to get people to the moon uh, so what now we can do is I mean I think we we they're making a big deal about oh we've got our astronauts now and whatever but they could send them up there right now you know it's no big deal we've got we've got the technology to do it so you know I, it uh, it just makes me mad that I'm I'm just hoping I live long enough to see us get to the moon again, which I think I will. I think probably we're talking 2024, maybe 2025. Yeah, we're talking only two or three years from now we should be back on the moon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, again, what? What? Oh no, I was just gonna say, and I think I think also just think of all the technology. The advances we've made in phones and computers and all that stuff from that point that we stopped the program till now and now you sort of miss that even though there's technology going on in different fields but you really weren't able to concentrate that technology in the space program and now you're sort of behind even though technologies continue to advance on you haven't had all that experience of technology in in that field well you know? also i don't think back in the uh, about the time we went to the moon or after we went to the moon that we had the technology to be able to do, say, what SpaceX is doing, which mm -hmm. is a really right. simple right. rocket that can get them there. Uh, uh, it's a little, it's not that easy, okay? You know, it's not that easy. And now it is. I mean, am I right? I mean, SpaceX couldn't have existed 30 years ago. I don't think we no. have the technology to do it that easily, you know? Mm -hmm. But now, I mean, they're building. In fact, the problem is, is that NASA wants to keep going, so they're doing their stuff. But they're the rocket they were they're sending people to the moon with is nothing new. It's the old. Right, going, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but it's the old um, uh, shuttle rockets that we're using to send that up. Am I right or wrong about that? I I thought we were going to be using like the same Titan Five type engine that we yes, use to pop. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's nothing new. Whereas over at SpaceX, they're a whole different a whole different breed of rockets. Yeah. You know? Uh, and they're building huge ones. Yeah. You know, now I don't know how it's coming along. We haven't heard anything lately ever since uh, Elon Musk is With hunkered Twitter, down at yeah. Twitter, you know. I mean I'm you know, hmm? They had a report today that that Elon Musk has has let go eighty percent of Twitter since he's yeah. 
and gone. Eighty percent of that company is gone. Can you believe that? Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's how you know how people juiced up these companies. You know, during during COVID time. Well, and they now, may have they may have had too many people to run that that. Thing, yeah. You know. That, yeah. I mean, I noticed that Twitter is still there. Exactly. You yeah. Know? People are still able to post on Twitter. It hasn't yeah. really changed. So if he got rid of 80% of the people, apparently there were people who had their feet up on their desk and were chewing gum. Exactly. Yeah. I think a lot of companies were like that, especially during COVID time when they got so much money and now they yeah. start laying people off and then everybody's freaking out saying, oh my God, you know, everything's crashing. But yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm uh, very uh, happy with, uh, uh, you know, I, I, with what SpaceX is doing, but I wish they would do it more, you know. And I wish they would do it faster. They can't do it fast enough for me. Because then we can send uh, uh, our old friend Tony up in a rocket. I'm a little scared of rides. You're scared of rides. I, I can't people, even go on any road. They'd have to knock me out to go up people there. People would say, you couldn't get me in one of those rockets. And no I, way. And I said, you can, I, couldn't I would do it in a second. You're brave. Right? They'd have to knock uh, me no, out. I, I, I would do it in a second. I don't think there's anything. Re, there's there is an ever present possible possibility of danger. I wonder what it feels like. But it's not be. that great a danger anymore. I mean, you got to realize, SpaceX has sent up how many rockets? You that know, and, and if, have there been have there been any problems with them? No. Not at all. And then the whole ability to make them land back here. You know, yeah. in the beginning, they were losing them like crazy. They would topple over and everything else. Yeah. Do you know, ever since they sent up one that absolutely didn't have any problems, they have never had a problem bringing yeah. those rockets back and having them do a landing? That's amazing. That is just amazing. NASA can't do anything like that. They try. Well, they took the easy road, drop it in the sea where you can just splash and then they go find them. Well, this the, the easiest job is to have the thing land and then put another bunch of stuff on there and send them back yeah. up again, you know? So so I've been very happy with SpaceX. I know, I don't like Elon Musk. Well, you know, even a stopwatch is right twice a day, <laughs> so don't feel bad about that. Hmm. I notice there is now a bed in that room with you, Brian. Yes. What is your yeah. wife making you sleep uh, somewhere oh. else uh, these days? Uh, sometimes. Oh, you put a Are bed you in, in the there. Dog house? Wait, wait, wait a minute. Not today. You put a bed in there. No, and, and, you know, and now Adrian no. is using it to lie in. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, I this is yeah. <laughs> That's a good answer. So I have my DJ stuff in here. I have my office in here. She wanted her office in here, so I put a table in here for her office. She never used it. Not Adrian, but Tiffany. And then she kept saying, oh, I want to put a bed in there. I want to put a bed in there in case this people come over, in case these people come over. And those people never come over. Yeah. So I finally caved in. I said, okay, now my DJ stuff doesn't fit, so I got to put that downstairs, maybe in the garage. I don't know. So How, how, many, how many bedrooms do you have in that house? Five. Five bedrooms. So you 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 don't have enough bedrooms for guests? <laughs> no, Wait, yeah, three okay. kids. You got, Adrian, no. Simon, Stephanie, ours, and then the office. Plus oh, five. I see. Okay, all right. Okay. But yeah, I'm ready to kick out Simon pretty soon. Seventeen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So now, Ad so we just got this new bed, and Adrian loves it. So we're getting one for her because she has but like the bunk bed sort of. She's up here, and then the bottom was like a play area. So now she wants a grown up, you know, grown up bed. Isn't so. the idea of bunk beds is you have two people sleeping in them, yeah. and not having one well, level and then another one to play in? Come on. Well, that's that's how they are. So yeah. So yeah. so she likes this one. So now I'm gonna get it. We just got her one for her room. That should be here tomorrow or something. So I'll set that one up. So yeah. Get so her what out. are you gonna do with that bed? Get it ready for when I'm in the doghouse. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you know the bad thing was, and she's not here, so I could talk really loud about her. So, <laughs> so, 
you know, I found I hated, you know, when in the doghouse, you know, I'm like, I'm going in the other room. But I found this with this mattress, this foldable three piece mattress thing that is so comfortable. So now whenever I'm just like gone, I'm gone, I'm going in the office to sleep. So now she doesn't like it because I'm too comfortable in here with a too comfortable, you know, bed. So now she, she didn't like that. So mm -hmm. now Adrian's taking it over. Adrian is now dancing for us. Yeah. yeah. She's, um, well, anyway, so anything else that we haven't covered today that's uh, happening? Of course, uh, you know, Trump is in New York. And, and, and by the way, uh, tying up traffic again, you know, I mean, oh. it, it costs us so much money just they, having him come to town. They played this thing today, and I, I mentioned this like last week or the week before. That what they're doing with AI now is they're mimicking celebrity voices. And on CNN, I think it's CNN or somewhere, they had uh, Joe Rogan interviewing Trump. And Trump was speaking too quick because he doesn't speak that. Yeah, he doesn't talk that fast. He's a little bit slower. But the all the other part of Trump's voice and all the part of Joe Rogan's voice, it sounded like they were talking to each other. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, you know, these things are not hard to do, and but I don't think. See, what I hate is is that all of a sudden something happens like AI, and then all mm -hmm. of a sudden all the news organizations are doing stories about AI and how mm -hmm. horrible AI is and how it's going to cause this problem and that problem and so on and so forth. I got to tell you, you know, I mean. Uh, there used to be pe people who just impersonated people's voices who were pretty good at it, you okay. know. Uh, I just, I'm so tired of, of uh, uh, the news people who have no oh. sense of, of science, who then mm. scare the people in Congress who have even more no sense of science. I mean, I read an article the other day that I think finally needed to be written. Somebody wrote an article about, it's ridiculous, TikTok isn't dangerous. And it gave all the reasons why. You know, that for the most part, it's just, if anything, it shows how stupid America has become that we will watch something like this endlessly. But I've looked at TikTok, I sit on the can, it's a great thing when you're sitting on the can to just flip through TikTok, right? I have yet to see anything that even approaches Chinese propaganda on TikTok. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've seen kitties playing with string, you know, endless things of kitties playing with string, uh, uh, endless things of women uh, twerking, mm -hmm. which, you know, what's the harm in that unless you get in the way, you know? I mean, am I right, Charlie? I mean, is TikTok really the danger they make it out to be? I wouldn't think so. I've never done... TikTok, so and and they say what they say is is that they have these algorithms and they're going to be able to get data on you and know everything about you. Isn't yeah. that called Google? Isn't that called yeah. Facebook? Isn't that called yeah. YouTube? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, I think Facebook. I think Facebook's more dangerous because that Facebook is is getting groups together that because of distance and everything else haven't been able to get together before and some of those can be dangerous but they're so. not asking facebook to sell their company because they're getting algorithms and getting data on you yeah. you know and that's the stupidity because you have all these congressmen who know nothing about science and in okay. fact who are afraid of it so yeah. speaking of spacex how many how many total launches do you think spacex has, has done so far I'm going to I'm going to estimate somewhere around 1000. Oh, really? Nah, 222 launches. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah, 184 to uh, cuz there were a couple of months there where they were doing them every other day. Yeah. yeah. 156 total reflights. So that's recycling their their units. Wow. That's pretty good. Yeah, they they have one but they do show a lot of them. I mean, they they show a lot of stuff going off of SpaceX. They have a big calendar and like, yeah. you know, every Week they're doing something there, and if you would compare that to NASA, yeah, they're hardly yeah. doing anything. Yeah, and it's just getting to the point where you know they're they're doing so many launches, you don't you know you don't even know they're doing them. Well, correct me yeah, if I'm wrong. Yeah. yeah, Charlie, yeah. Charlie, you, you probably could be, uh, you could probably, uh, you know, chime in on this. 
And that is, don't you think that what's happening now with uh, SpaceX is that uh, with uh, with NASA is that they just are trying to keep the organization going? You know, they really have nothing to contribute. You know, I mean, isn't isn't SpaceX starting to do all the heavy lifting even with NASA? Except for the unmanned uh, probes to other planets. Yeah, That's basically just NASA. Right. Right. Uh, and uh, you're right about Earth orbit and stuff like that. That's all. <laughs> NASA's pretty much giving that up. Oh, they've sent it, it. Actually, what they did is they saved our ass because the Russians didn't want to take us up there anymore. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to get to the space station? Walk? You know, I mean, no. So, I mean, they had to have some way to get up to the space station and uh, SpaceX gave it to them. You want to go up tomorrow? We can, we got a rocket ready. Don't worry. We can we can get you there. You know. Mm -hmm. So I mean that's that's what's happened. So anyway, I'm I'm I, I was so sad about the whole space thing for years. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I wrote a I wrote a, a story a long time ago, just a little short story about a bunch of people about us going and landing on the moon. And when we got there, we found us, you know, the remnants of what was a spaceship. And then it turns out this thing's happening a thousand years ahead, uh, uh, years ahead from now. And the question was, why didn't we ever go back? Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a great little story, but you know, I think it kind of was almost the truth. Why didn't we ever go back? You know, I was amazed. <laughs> What? Some of those people believe that we never went to the moon. It was like those self doubt. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not uh -huh. No, uh, amazingly enough, we did, and and what we did to get there. I mean, it was all spit and string. You, so you were lucky right? enough to see it on TV. That had to be a major event. What? Right when they landed and they walked the moon. I mean, wow. Yeah, it was. I mean, we we never had a moment like that. People ever, never. Okay. I'll tell you what happened, and then I. Well, we had got about another minute. Uh, people <clears throat> never truly one realized what that moment meant that for the first time in the history of mankind we had left this planet uh -huh. and gone to another orb orb uh, and that was pretty amazing that's think about the historic quality of that and nobody realized the significance of it even when it happened am i right charlie it is oh one or two people in the whole world yeah huh the one or two people in the whole world realized it. yeah i mean it's just it, it, nobody realizes significance i mean when we write the history of mankind the day yeah. we went to the moon is going to be one of those significant minutes or moments or hours or whatever <clears throat> crazy feeling and that, they yeah. got them there in this what is this was essentially a tin can yeah you know so <laughs> anyway Hey, listen. Uh, we're uh, we're running uh, we're running close to the end of the program. In fact, I could probably start the theme going here. Uh, you guys have been wonderful uh, because nobody called tonight except you, and we've had a really nice time. You know, thank went by you. Quick. Huh? Went by quick. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Brian. We appreciate it. Thank you, Alex. Well, you, I'm glad to be here. Uh, thank you, uh, Jeff, and thank you to Tony, and thanks to Charlie Wallace, who is our our scientific. Uh, you're you're our new. We should just make you the new science guy on the show, and you know we can build you up like the guys over here at our planetarium. You know. So anyway, that's it. Okay. Um, See you all, uh, I guess, tomorrow night, huh? Everybody, wave goodbye, and I'll wave goodbye at you. There they go, folks. That's our citizen panel for tonight. And uh, listen, we're out of here now, but Jack Bishop is next over most of the same station. Uh, he'll be doing uh, the, uh, uh, the, what do you call it, the, uh, uh, the intersection. And he'll be taking your calls over there at, um, let's see here. We'll be taking your calls at uh, on Skype at uh, GabNet Live. Okay, all right, that's it for tonight, folks. I'm Alex Bennett. 
Have yourself a very nice uh, evening, the rest of the evening. And then we'll see you again right back here tomorrow night, same time, same station in life. And in the meantime, as always, if you see her, tell her I love her, okay? Good night, everybody. <laughs>